Good morning, another beautiful Lord's Day, and we're so glad that you're here this morning. Again, if you're visiting with us, we hope you will fill out a visitor's card and give us every opportunity to say how much we appreciate you being here this morning. Off with the old. Our text is Ephesians 4, beginning in verse 17. Have your Bibles, and I hope you do. Be turning over there to Ephesians 4, 17. Let's read this together in just a couple of minutes. Before we do, take your mind back to a story in John chapter 11. It's a story of three people, one who is very sick to the point of death, and then there is, of course, two others, Mary and Martha. When we look at Mary and Martha and we come into this particular story, again, we find Lazarus very ill at the point of death. How do we know that? Because he would soon die. But as we look at this, even though Jesus was the great physician and would be able to heal Lazarus, the Bible tells us that Jesus waited until he died. When he reached the town and the friends there of Lazarus were there, both sisters approached Jesus and they exclaimed to him, if only you'd been here, he wouldn't have died. But there was more to this death than either sister knew. Jesus looked upon this grieving family, and as he looked upon the grieving family, he himself began to grieve. The text tells us in John 11 that Jesus wept. One of those verses when we were children... And we had to memorize a verse. That was the verse we wanted to memorize. Jesus wept. But the question became, why did Jesus weep? Why was he crying? We all know that sometimes we're overcome with grief when we see others that are overcome with grief. I've sat in the roadway with people that were in despair and grieving because of one that had just died in a in a car accident or outside of a house where one had just committed suicide. And you sit there and you realize that all you can do is cry, hug and cry. Many families have done that over and over again. So some suppose that Jesus was caught up in that grieving process. He had the same human emotions that you and I do. Others have said that his weeping was because he was about to break this funeral up. After all, Jesus never went to a funeral that he didn't break up. So some have supposed that, that maybe he was crying because he knew he was bringing Lazarus back from the dead. After all, Lazarus had been dead for several days. We know that because they tell Jesus when he was preparing to go into Lazarus' tomb, don't do it, he stinks. He's been dead for several days. Don't go in there. See, Jesus never attended a funeral that he didn't break up. And he broke this one up. You can't have a funeral if you don't have someone that's dead. And so this one was one that was certainly ended very quickly. They took away the stone. Jesus prayed. Then with a loud voice, Jesus said, Lazarus, come forth. Why? Lazarus, come forth. One old preacher many years ago said it was Lazarus, come forth, because if he had just simply said, come forth, the whole graveyard would have emptied out. That's the power of God and the power of Christ. Jesus said to Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out. But his hands and feet were wrapped in strips of linen. Jesus said, take off those grave clothes and let him go. John eleven forty four. 44. It brings us to our text this morning. Because Jesus wants you and he wants me to take off those grave clothes. And put on those grace clothes. As we read our text beginning in verse 17, 
He says there in Ephesians 4, this I say therefore and testify in the Lord that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over unto lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness. But ye have not so learned Christ, if so be that you've learned, heard him, and have been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus. In verse 22, that you put off concerning the former conversation, the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful love, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. When we understand there are two parts, there is that which must die if we're truly going to be the New Testament children of God, and then there's that part we must put on. Take off the grave clothes, put on the grace clothes. And when we talk about the grave, the first thing we have to do is to think differently. One of the biggest problems we're facing, not only in the world today, but in the Lord's church today, is that stinking thinking. It's that thinking that needs to change. It's that thinking that needs to be more Christ-like. People say, why is the church not growing today? It's because the thinking ain't what it ought to be. Because when the thinking ain't what it ought to be, the actions are not what they ought to be. James said, be ye doers of the word, not just hearers only. We have congregations over and over again that are full of people that are happy to warm the pews, that are happy to listen, happy to sing, oh, how I love Jesus, but refuse to do anything to seek and save that which is law. That's why you're here. There are so many people still walking around with those grave clothes on. Why? Because they're dead. Jesus will make us alive again. But so many are walking around dead. Paul's statement is, you must no longer live as the Gentiles do. It's not a compliment to the Gentiles, is it? You can't live like the gentile in galatians 5 he makes it very clear you choose flesh or spirit you can't dabble in both of them and be pleasing in either one so many people today are miserable in the church and they're miserable in the world why because they got a lot a little bit of world in them so they're miserable in the church and they got a little bit of church in them and they're miserable in the world so we have to make a decision Flesh or spirit? The Gentiles were walking after the flesh. Or at least they were. Until they began to walk and talk as children of God should. And all of that comes about with that stinking thinking. Not thinking like we should and not doing as we should. No real substance or purpose. That's what we find with those that have not put on Christ. And the reason is because of darkness. That's why that thinking isn't what it ought to be. That's why in 1 John 1, 7, G, the, John emphasizes the walking in the light as he is in the light, Jesus Christ. So that we can have fellowship one with another and, the, and Christ's blood cleansing us from all sin. We can't walk in darkness. He shows us that comparison of light and darkness in 1 John 1, beginning with verse 7. Then in Romans 1, 24, 26, 28, there's a phrase, God gave them over. If you just refuse and you want to keep having that kind of thinking, the kind of thinking that takes you away from God, God loves you, but he says, all right, fine. If it's the world you want, it's the world you get. If it's the fleshly desires, take it. If you want to think your human wisdom is best, God says, go ahead. That's what's wrong with a lot of the things in the world today and in our country today. 
It's because God has been removed from everything. So God says, if that's what you want, see what it's like not having me in anything, not having me in the school, not having me in government, not having me in anything. Let's just see what you it, see if you like it. And we can see the mess we're in. The Christian cannot pattern himself after the unsaved person. Oh, but I just want to fit in, preacher. Well, you can't. If you're a child of God, if you're wearing the name Christian, you're a peculiar individual. You will not fit in with the world and be acceptable to God. You just can't do it. You've got to put on those grace clothes. You've got to put on those grace clothes. Look at the text. See the change that takes place. In verse 20 and 21 of chapter 4, read it again. He says, but ye have not so learned Christ. If so be that you've heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus. It's not in man out there. It's not in the wisdom of man. It's not in the ability of man. You cannot be saved that way. It is truly through grace. We're saved by grace through faith. You do your part. We got no doubt God's going to do his part. But you do have a part to play in this. It's not grace only. It is through faith. Look at those in Hebrews 11 that were faithful to God. They were faithful. They were obedient. They worked at it. And it's not that the meritorious work would get them to heaven but they couldn't get there without it either. Ultimately, no matter how much work we would do, we still would be unworthy, but grace, grace, will pick up the slack. We may not be able to work our way to heaven, but it'd sure be nice if we would die trying. Grace. The phrase, no Christ, occurs nowhere else in the scripture. We're not talking about knowing the doctrine of Christ, but we're talking about the intimacy of knowing Christ himself. And that's what Paul is trying to get across to these brethren over and over again. Whether it's Romans or the Corinthians or Galatians or Ephesians, Paul is trying to drive that home to them and to you and me. This fellowship and communion with Christ is so great, it changes who you are. Because once it changes your thinking, it changes your actions. And then you're no longer one of those that sit on the sidelines. But you're one of those that get in the game. And granted, it's not a game. When we're talking the difference between heaven and hell, there is nothing in this life more serious. It's not a game. Remember, Paul said the unsaved man is spiritually ignorant and separated from the life of God. Saved man, just the opposite. You see, when I come to know Jesus, everything changes. When I accept him, everything changes. When those on the day of Pentecost in Acts 2 and verse 37 were pricked in their heart, and they said, men and brethren, what do we do? Peter and the rest of the apostles said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sin. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Some 3,000 did that that day. And some 3,000 were added to the Lord's church that day. It's the same way in which you and I are added to the Lord's church. We go through the book of conversion, the book of Acts, and we see over and over again the question being posed in, in a variety of ways. Lord, what will thou have me to do? Here's water, what doth hindereth me to be baptized? Over and over again, 12 noon, 12 midnight, the answer was the same. Now is the time. Today is the day. They didn't wait. They didn't put it off. They didn't say, let's get a group together. In a week, we'll have a baptism. Because there was the realization in the first century church that salvation came and contact with the blood came at the point of baptism. Not to exclude belief, repentance, and confession. But to realize the point of salvation came at baptism. It did then and it does today. So many refuse to change. 
People don't like to face themselves and admit the need for change. I ask today, though, have you taken off your grave clothes and have you put on the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? If you haven't, then you need to. And if you have and you've wandered away, you need to come home. If we can help, you need to come now as we stand and sing.